Coming up on Small Town Big Deal. We're at the Vent Haven Ventriloquist Convention. Just look who's talking. You doing good me? Are you doing fine? Yeah, I'm doing fine. The annual event that's all about finding one's voice. Whoa. And all of a sudden, America's Got Talent, kaboom. And I've become one of the top headliners in Vegas. We're spending a little time with the voice of entertainment, Damn. Terry Fader. What? Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. And there is one town where people gather every summer. Where people gather every summer in hopes of finding, finding their, their dreams. dreams. And for many, it's the first step and on a, a journey, journey for them to find their voice. Will you put some words in my mouth? Exactly! Boy, Boy, TV. Look inside my mouth. Oh. Putting words in someone else's mouth isn't exactly considered polite. But here at the Vent Haven International Ventriloquist Convention, Are you doing fine? Yes, I'm doing fine. Putting words in someone else's or something else's mouth is just fine. <laughs> this is Mr. Wilson. That's right, Wilson is the name. That's right, and you can't get it wrong because it's tattooed on his butt right there. Boy, did that hurt. <laughs> More than 600 ventriloquists, or vents as they like to be called, gather in Elanger, Kentucky for three days every July. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Erlinger sits just across from Cincinnati on the banks of the Ohio River. It's the place for vents to see and be seen. Oh, stop it. And of course, be heard. Hey, you. Oh. That's why I saw so many people out in the lobby with dolls. <laughs> Glad you're not like that. Um, well, Randall, we'll have that conversation later. Ventriloquism has had a renaissance of late, not only earning new fans, but also becoming big business. They came here to watch you entertain them. Oh, entertain them, yes. Oh. Terry Fader landed a five-year deal at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, valued at $100 million. Jeff Dunham has landed on the Forbes list of highest earning celebrities, and Darcy Lynn reached millionaire status while still in middle school. I'd like to buy oh, a shirt. One of the cool things you'll find here is ventriloquistic merchandise of all kinds that's for sale. There are props for the pros. I have invented a dummy throne, a dummy chair. And there are books for beginners. Dewey. But Dude, only at a ventriloquist yes. convention oh, will you Dude, find moments Dude, like yes. this. If you pick up a puppet and he starts talking to you right away, you might have a match made. You know, so like me and Dewey, uh, eh, yeah, you're not that good though. That's okay. Call it puppet pair bonding, if you will. <laughs> you can see how some of these matches have worked out. So let's give it up for Jesse Smith. At the convention's open mic contest for amateurs. So Randall, what made you dye your hair blue? To match the goatee. Duh. Ten year old Jesse Smith is one of six kids performing at the Junior Open Mic Contest. What do you like specifically about it? I like how when you perform the puppet, it doesn't feel like it's a puppet. It feels like it, there's an actual person up there with you. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Tanya Triller. And the adults agree. Most major performers will tell you at some point there was a line that came out of the figure's mouth that they had no idea where it came from. Those moments are magical. Where am I? Um, this is the ventriloquist convention. <laughs> Ventriloquism has actually been around for centuries. Some believe dating back to ancient Egypt. They, they found a jackal god with a leather moving mouth in one of the pyramids. And it had a cord in the back and they think that the ventriloquist was the priest. And by pulling down on the cord, it make, make the jackal mouth open and close. At the heart of this convention is the desire to preserve the history of ventriloquism. Proceeds go to raise money for the Vent Haven Museum in nearby Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. Annie, what exactly is Vent Haven? So Vent Haven is the world's only museum dedicated to ventriloquism. Yes, there really is a ventriloquist museum. And as more donations come in, space is at a premium. 
So they're hoping to raise money for a new museum building. I mean, there is a tremendous amount of attention to detail in all of these. Wow, it's really interesting when I look around here and I see all the pictures on the wall. I recognize so many of these. For those of a certain age, the faces lining the walls and the dummies lining the shelves might look familiar. I recognize him. That's the great Lester, right? Yeah. So he was really obsessed with lip control, making sure he talked without moving his lips. And you can see he would do this distant voice where he would make a telephone call. See you tomorrow night. Okay. All right. Yeah. Tomorrow night, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Hang out. They, they want to know tomorrow night. You said okay, didn't you? Why, well, certainly I did. So this is... Cecil Wigglenose. <laughs> And bringing one of these to life isn't as easy as it looks. He has a system of controls that are typewriter keys. You've got the, the mouth and the upper lip. There's the nose, the ears, and the front leg. <gasps> Visitors come from all across the country to experience the story of ventriloquism, to see firsthand these figures of speech, now mute but still adored. It's a trip well worth it for seven-year-old Lennon Hellman, who came from West Virginia. Pinocchio. I'm in ventriloquism heaven. Like right now, like I want to touch the dummies, but I know that you're not allowed to. Hi, Wendy, how are you? Good, thank you. Good Back at the convention, you. executive director Mark Wade is you? making the rounds, welcoming old friends. He says ventriloquism has often been misunderstood by outsiders. We'll see you guys later. In the old days, a lot of the puppets looked kind of similar and were kind of some were kind of scary and eerie. Now they come up with these soft puppets. This is a soft puppet. That's the thing I'm soft. And do you think you can teach me a little bit? Yeah, I would give you the nuts and bolts of it, the basics okay. of it. To make a puppet talk using ventriloquism, you take the tip of your tongue, put the tip of the tongue right behind the back of your front teeth like this. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? He's got to work at it. I know he's got to work at it. Really doing. Let's have fun. Let's have fun. And for the letter F, you say TH, so fun comes out. Fun. Let's have fun. Yeah, you want to open your mouth just a, little, just a teeny bit more. He's getting this. I know. Let's have fun. This ain't fun. No. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to be a ventriloquist. Say hello. Hello. This is Amy. Yeah, I'm Amy. Yeah. But for those who can talk this talk, the Vent Haven Ventriloquist Convention is also a homecoming. That's what it's all about: learning and, and being with friends and writing material together and camaraderie. And that's the love that holds us this thing together. Arguably, the size of a ventriloquist's heart speaks volumes to the magnitude of their imagination. Please don't, please don't. Up next, every ventriloquist needs at least one partner. Meet the man behind the match. And I carve him and I do the best job I can. And a little later. I, I always knew I could do impressions and singing and ventriloquism. I just never really put them all three together. A chat with comic Terry Fader. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, every ventriloquist requires at least one good partner. And finding the right match requires someone who has just the right touch. Oh, you talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to me? We're at the Vent Haven International Ventriloquist Convention in Erlinger, Kentucky. Why did the human cross the road? <laughs> what? And nearby in Fort Mitchell is the only museum in the world dedicated to ventriloquism. Some of the dummies here date back to the mid-1800s. The museum is open to anyone. People come from around the country and all corners of the globe to visit. Ventriloquists attending the convention are encouraged to stop by. I can see all these different puppets that I admired growing up watching TV, and here they are in, in person. But the museum doesn't just pay homage to performers. These are all grouped by the creators? Right, the figure maker. The so, figure maker. Yeah, when you're looking at a dummy, you're really looking at the product of two artists. So there's the person who sculpted the dummy, made the creation, and then there's the ventriloquist who gave it a personality, gave it a voice, brought it to life. Today, many of the dummies, or figures as some call them, 
are made out of foam or cloth. It used to be that dummies, like Edgar Bergen's famous Charlie McCarthy, were made of wood. Today, finding <laughs> new handcrafted wooden ones is hard. Hard? Yes, but not impossible. Tucked away in a quiet little corner of a small town, one man is carving out his own slice of ventriloquism history. How many wood handcrafted ventriloquist makers are there? Well, I'm going to say less than seven. Of these seven, I'm the only one that I know of that strictly does it by mallet and chisel. Mine is true handcrafted. Nearly 500 miles from the Vent Haven Museum in the small town of Beaufort, South Carolina, is where you'll find Conrad Hartz. Conrad is a rare breed. For decades, he's been carving wooden dummies in his modest backyard shed. As a kid, he practiced ventriloquism with traditional handmade wooden dummies. But as time passed, fewer people made them and they became harder to find. So Conrad took matters into his own hands. Well, I started when I was 31. I'd never picked up a knife in my life. But I had the passion to make these things. I'm really impressed with the dummies that Conrad makes and in the old fashioned way, but what really surprised me, you had to really teach yourself how to do this. Yes. There weren't classes. There were no books. No books? No. He's using the exact same tools he did the day he started. After decades of carving so many dummies, for so many different performers, it's impossible to know exactly how many he's made. Still, he takes pride in knowing his creations are out there entertaining others. Sometimes you see these crop up on TV, you know, like I did on uh, David Letterman. <gasps> Captain Kangaroo had one of my figures on. Ultimately, when it comes to how he crafts his figures, Conrad keeps it simple. People who come down expect elaborate equipment with all kind of vices and stuff. And like I say, I use my leg. Your leg is your vice. Yes. You gotta be kidding. Conrad describes his style as goofy, and that's perfect for ventriloquism. <laughs> the inspiration for his design is rooted right in his backyard. The face is already in that tree. And so I have to keep that in my mind that that face is down there. And all I do is carve in the wood around that face. Inside every dummy is actually sort of this complex system that makes it come alive. This is the back of the head. Not many people get to see this. No. And I use a nylon pulley because nylon is silent. Silent. And the only sound you want is coming from the no ventriloquist. All these are little tips that I had to learn over the years. You had to learn the hard way. Yeah, you learned the hard way. In today's world of the mass-produced, Conrad Hartz has no problem taking his time. Sure, it may take him a little longer. But it's original, and nobody has a copy of it except you. Still ahead? Hi, I'm Terry Fader, and I'm Willie Nelson. You're watching Small Town Big Deal. I'm the big deal. He's nothing. Some double talk with Vegas headliner Terry Fader. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. Hey, I just threw a tennis ball for you. Can you go get it? We're at the International Ventriloquist Convention in Erlinger, Kentucky. <laughs> it's where performers and their one-of-a-kind wacky sidekicks <laughs> let loose. We're at the Van Haven Convention. <gasps> no way! Oh my god! <laughs> the gathering is just eclectic enough to draw in a few non-ventriloquist types really takes me right back to my childhood and all of the things I loved. So it's great to see it now as an adult. Yes, he is. But most come to the convention with their sights set on one thing. Realizing their dreams of entertaining the masses. Ay, ay, ay. I ain't falling apart. Terry Fader is a ventriloquist living that dream. And he's got the paycheck to prove it, earning a cool $17 million last year alone. You might recall his phenomenal first place $1 million win on the hit TV show America's Got Talent in 2007. Terry says the convention should really be a top priority for anybody who's got the ventriloquism bug. 
it's probably the most important thing uh, for ventriloquists. It can teach you so much. There are so many great, incredibly talented ventriloquists, maybe that, that no one's ever even heard of, but they are so good that have honed their craft over 30, 40, 50 years, and it's, it is, it's the most important thing a ventriloquist can do. We met up with Terry in his dressing room at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas. It's been the home of his act since 2009. Well, Vicki, thank you much, so much for joining us. Oh, honey, I am glad to be here tonight. To say Terry has a unique brand of blending comedy and singing is probably an understatement. Take a listen to Winston the Singing Turtle. Winston's my overall favorite because there's no doubt, a turtle singing Roy Orbison, that captured America's hearts. Yeah. It just absolutely did. That's my first puppet. Ever. That As a kid cool. growing up in Dallas, he'd practice in his bedroom closet, out of earshot from his dad. I was born with the need to entertain. My dad was always disappointed. Uh, he felt like that I, I did not get my calling because he wanted me to be a minister. Despite his father's disapproval, Terry still pursued ventriloquism. The first 25 years of his career working the county fair circuit, it was tough to find his name anywhere. Then in 2007, at age 42, that win on America's Got Talent catapulted him into the upper echelon of entertainers. Terry was big news. How fast then did your whole life change? Oh, overnight. I was probably working 900 shows a year because I was doing three shows a day. So we're talking like so much work. And then all of a sudden, America's Got Talent, kaboom and I've become one of the top headliners in Vegas and have been here ever since. He may be a top headliner, but when it comes to his act, it's clear who gets the final say. Just be quiet and let me do my thing. Okay, fine. <laughs> you can hear him clacking, so <laughs> yeah. Don't put your finger in my mouth. I don't know where that finger's in. Okay. Despite all his success, it's Terry's strong faith that keeps him grounded. I understand as a Christian, I desperately need God's forgiveness just like every other person on the planet. I'm no different Doesn't than anyone change. else. Yeah. Whether I'm rich, whether I'm famous, whether I'm, you know, I have a lot of talent, makes absolutely no difference. And for the son of a minister who never wanted to be one, well, it's interesting how things work out. And I cannot tell you the countless emails and letters I get from people that say, um, I, I had cancer, I was going through chemo, and watching your videos got me through it. I can levitate. That's what God called me to do. So I am a minister, just not the kind of minister my dad wanted me to be. <laughs> and that keeps Terry Fader focused on the future. I feel like one of these days I'm gonna be able to look back and go, wow, that was some career. But right now I'm so focused on, on just making it the best I can that I, I don't, I'm not really thinking about it, you know? We'll be right back. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. And you know, one of my favorite parts was seeing all the young ventriloquists at the convention. I love meeting Conrad and seeing his passion for creating the dummies, you know, the old fashioned way. Love that. And meeting Terry Fader and spending time with him, like, what an entertainer. Oh my gosh, and what a nice guy. Terry, would you be my new best friend? I'm Rodney Miller. <laughs> and I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. One, two, done. Okay, very good. Except you One, moved your lips. Two, <laughs> okay. You might you want to open your mouth <laughs> just a teeny bit more. He's getting this, I know. One, two, done. <laughs> this ain't fun, no. <laughs> it's a lot One, of fun. One, two, done. Yeah. Let's have fun. Well, we have smart Alex. <laughs> <laughs> it's his show. I know. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I need to breathe in. <laughs> he's he's going to pass out. No, he's not going to. He's going to. Don't, don't die here. No, that's not. <laughs>